welcome to First Presbyterian Church. My name is Reverend Rosie, and we are grateful that you are worshiping with us this morning. Our church's mission is to share God's love and shine God's light. And so it's our hope and prayer that you will experience the love and light of God in worship with us this morning. A couple of announcements I'd like to remind you of. Our congregational meeting is January 31st, and it will be on Zoom at 11 o'clock to give those that um, are viewing the worship in, inside the sanctuary time to get home and those that um, don't necessarily stay up early in the morning uh, to, to be able to log in to that, that congregational meeting with us. I'd also like to share with you that we are trying to do a Valentine cookie exchange through the membership care team. So if you are somebody who loves to bake, um, please make sure you check out that stuff, that information on the, uh, on the church emails and feel free to contact the office and let us know if you plan on participating in the cookie exchange. And so with that, let us come before the Lord with our hearts and our minds and our hopes as we bring our hearts into worship. And the truth 
is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is merciful, will forgive us and lead us into a new life. Let us join our hearts and minds as one, confessing. Take a moment to bring yourself before the Creator. Holy Fountain of Forgiveness, the tale of Jonah reminds us of your never-ending love for all creation. May we be like the people of Nineveh who were able to acknowledge your sin and open their eyes to your healing presence. Though you stand ready to forgive our sin, we find it easier to bite our tongues, clench our fists, and cling to our hurts and resentments rather than, than let you open, open our hearts. hearts. We, we trust you, Holy One. We, we pour out our hearts to you. Do not be afraid. God is with you. That is good news. You do not have to go through life alone, wondering if anyone cares about you or knows your heart. God knows and God loves you. Rejoice, for thus it is, has always been, and will continue to be. God's love for you is eternal. Amen.
of the universe, thank you that your promises are sure. You are faithful. We can rely on you. Your word says that we will find joy in offering our time, talents, and money to meet the needs of others. Help, Help us to give freely and cheerfully towards their work of their, their kingdom. May you cause the seeds that we sow to grow into well water, fruitful trees of life. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word. And give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's reading is from Mark. Mark 1, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of the God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, reading today comes from the prophet Jonah. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, 10, verse 10, and as well as chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to her church today. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, get up. Go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days' walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going in a day's walk. And then he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. And when the Lord, when God saw what they had done, and how they had turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring on them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord, Oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was sitting in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew you were a gracious God. And merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishment. And now, O oh God, please take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under the shade, waiting to see what would become 
of the city. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we know that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But we in our humanness hurt. We in our humanness get angry. And your ways don't always make sense to us. Lord, be with us today. Be with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts. And may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is an interesting day as we discuss the scriptures. We have two very different kinds of calling and prophetic work that happens here in the scriptures today. The scripture that John read, you probably are pretty familiar with, right? The, uh, the, the come and follow me and I will make you fisher of people or fishers of men. Come with me and, and I will help you to connect with people around you. Follow me and I will do work through your hands. Come with me and, and you will see a different world. You'll journey around, you'll leave the place in which you were, and you'll go and do new work. You'll sit with sinners and prostitutes and, 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 and do this cool ministry alongside Jesus. And then we have the prophet Jonah. Now, most people are familiar with the first part of Jonah's story. That Jonah hears the call of God and leaves, trying to go the opposite direction towards Tarshish. There is an issue on the boat that he's on where a storm comes. They figure out that it's Jonah that's running from the call of God, and they throw him overboard, and Jonah ends up in the belly of a great fish, and then thrown up on the shores of Nineveh to do the work that God had asked him to do. Now, I want to be very clear that I think that Jonah gets a bad rep. There is a lot happening underneath this text that I really think enlightens us to this latter part of the story. Often when we hear this part of the story without some of the context, this, this whole, what I mean, Jonah prophesies to the people of Nineveh, they immediately turn their, in their ways, the whole city repents, and Jonah goes and sits up on a hill waiting for their destruction. And when they are not destroyed because they have changed their ways, he's mad about it. Now, we very often can hear that and think that Jonah was an awful person. Wanting their destruction and not believing in their ability to change. I want us to ease into that a little bit. Unfortunately, I think that this, this particular that understanding, that reading of it can lead to some anti-Semitism, but it can also lead us to think less of the work that Jonah did. But there's something deeper going on. You have to understand that Nineveh is a bad city. They are horrible people. 
people. They are an abusive people. They are conquerors. The fact that Jonah is afraid to go there, it's not necessarily that he's, a, he's afraid of them. It's that he doesn't want to go and put himself at risk. His personal safety is at danger, in danger, to go into this place and preach to them, prophesy to them. He's being asked to do the opposite of what we hear happening with the disciples. He's going alone. He's going into an aggressive territory. These people have been trying to conquer Israel for a very long time. For a very long time. Multiple attacks upon Israel and upon Judah. Multiple attempts to overthrow them. Multiple hurts. Thousands of people have died at the hands of the people who live in Nineveh. They are an abusive power. And I cannot stress that enough. And so when Jonah goes, and they say, suddenly, with his what? I mean, it's like four words. This is like the shortest sermon ever. He goes, uh, walks into the city and says, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. That's the entirety of his prophetic message. 40 days and you're going to be overthrown. And walks out. And they suddenly change and the whole city repents. And Jonah doesn't believe it. In my opinion, that's what's really happening. It's like somebody who's heard over and over and over again, no, no, I'll change my ways this time. Don't worry, sweetheart. I know I beat you for years, but today, today I've changed my ways. I know the Lord, and I will repent. This is about lack of trust. And I want to be very clear that Jonah's not wrong. Nineveh's work after this once they are saved, later becomes part of the problem leading to the exile. So the Assyrians are part of this. When we, we, Israel and Judea, go into exile, it's partly because the city of Nineveh and the people who live there still exist. They do not, in fact, change their ways. They do not, in fact, do long-term what they're called necessarily to do by Jonah as the prophet. So before you judge too quickly, Jonah sitting on the hill angrily with his arms folded, frustrated, waiting to watch the city be destroyed, I want you to put yourself there. Because I've been there. I've been there with friends and family. I've been there with people who have been hurt by an oppressor or an abusive person over and over and over and over again. And every time they say, I'm done, I'm over it, and then they, the person says, oh, oh, I'm going to change my ways. And I'm mad. I'm mad that that person 
person shows mercy once again. I'm mad that they stay in that abusive relationship. As white people, we also do this. Over and over again, we say to oppressed communities, we won't hurt you anymore. We've learned our lesson. And we haven't. We haven't. We might behave well for a period of time or, or try to do better, but ultimately the issue, the root of our evil and our hurt that we bestow upon others is still within us. So of course, the person or persons or communities being hurt are suspicious. I grew up in a Native American community in Oklahoma. There was a distrust. These are real problems. This is not some hypothetical prophecy story. And yet, What's interesting about Jonah itself is it's the only book of the Bible that ends with a rhetorical question. So whether these events are real or not, it is a thought experiment given to us by Scripture. And it's a powerful one. It's a powerful one. Because Jonah is standing on the hill, sitting there, and he says to God more words than he actually said to the people of Nineveh, by the way. Oh Lord, is this not what I said from the beginning, when I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish in the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than live. So if you hear that now with a different tone than you've heard it before, maybe Jonah is saying, I've opened the door for other people to be hurt in the future. Maybe Jonah is saying, I know, God, I know you're a good God, but I'm mad. And I don't want justice or kindness or love for these people who have hurt me. That is valid. That's valid. When I was in a position in my life where I was standing against an abuser in court, and I had someone say to me, as a Christian, be gracious to them. Be gracious. And I was so angry. was so angry. And I remember someone else, God bless them, saying to me that grace is God's job. And I think we see that here. We see that encounter happening here with Jonah and God. I don't want to be hurt anymore, says Jonah. I don't want my people to be hurt. And I'm mad about this. I can't believe you've asked me to do this and now I'm responsible for other people's hurt. And God says, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right? 
Now let's take the connotation from that. Our assumption is yes or no. Is it right? No, probably not right for them, to, for Jonah to be living in this anger and want hundreds of people to die. In fact, God repeats the same question, reminding Jonah at the very last bit of this of the chapter that there are hundreds of people that live there and animals too. And is it right? Is it right for you to be angry? We're left in this particular passage without answers. This is a struggle we have to have. This is a fight we have to have in our own mountain experience with God. When we reach these moments where we question God's grace, we have to be willing to stand on a mountain mat and argue with God. But I also want to remind you that God doesn't answer Jonah's question, or statement, actually. God simply asks a question, is it right for you to be angry? And I think that depends on the level of hurt. I think that matters when with what you're experiencing, I think all of those things matter. Because God does not tell him, do not be angry, Jonah. God stands with him in his anger and tells Jonah that he will not take his life, even though Jonah wants to die now. But God stands there holding this question. And so I ask you, I ask you to think about this, to explore what this means for you. Is it right to be angry? Amen.
together. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the ways in which you hold us, the ways in which you stand beside us, the ways in which you encourage us. We thank you for the times in which we, in our sin and in our brokenness, have been an abuser. That you reached out to us, that you loved us. Lord, we lift up to you the times in which we have been abused by systems or others or hurts that are deep in our souls. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being present with us, standing beside us in our anger and in our hurt and in our sadness and in our brokenness. Lord, we know that it is not so black and white, that we do not land in a category of good or evil, but somewhere in the middle, we land in this humanness. Thank you for becoming human. For fishing for our hearts and our minds and our spirits. For sending Christ to show us a different way. Lord, we lift up to you the things that live in our hearts that are in need of prayer in this time. We lift up those that are grieving. We lift up those that are sick. We lift up our leaders that are making decisions. We lift up those who lift us up. Lord, you taught us a prayer to pray when we don't know what to pray. And so be with us today as we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
then the compassion and love and grace of Christ will always surround you. This day and always. Our service is over, but our service in the world begins. Amen. Thank you.